Well, thank you for joining us today, men of our church. Uh, it's good to see you guys. And as I've said in our Tuesday morning study, I've missed you guys. I miss getting together with you guys. And so, uh, but what we're starting is we have Pastor David here with us again, as we will continue doing our weekly interviews. And, you know, I always join having this time sharing with us men, but I also enjoy spending our time with our pastor. How are you doing today, Pastor? I'm good. Thank you, John. It's always good to see you and spend time with you and as we are doing these interviews. And, uh, and you know, today our topic, Pastor, is it comes from 1 Kings chapter 2, and specifically in verses 1 through 2, where David is given his final instructions to his son Solomon. And what really points out to me here is he tells him in verse 2, be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And so today our topic, I'd like to address what being a man means in our society today, today, what being a man means spiritually, you know, because in this time and in our society, this has been lost, what being a man is. And I wanted to get your thoughts in light of what David has instructed Solomon. You know, a man is um, something much more, to be a man is something much more than what the stereotype has been uh, concerning manhood. Now, very often today, what we have is we have pictures of men who are called manly men, and uh, very often they're they're the fellows who might be like MMA fighters mm-hmm. or, you know, firefighters or police or, um, you name it, uh, somebody that's um, strong and aggressive and and all of that. And I think that those are qualities of manhood. Though you know, God has created man. Uh, the male species, uh, as protectors, as as um, individuals who are intended by him to to provide for family, to work hard, and to to protect their children, protect their wife. I mean, these are all things that are aspects of being a man. And I think that in our society, we've confused uh, what manhood is in so many ways that. It's almost just, uh, it's very difficult to even find uh, somebody that you could present as a, as a picture of a true man. And so when you have men who are s- saying that, in fact, they're females trapped in a man's body, and when you begin to uh, articulate uh, numerous genders and all, you know, the confusion is incredible. Plus, the feminization of men today to... To, to make men into, uh, you know, just actually just, we used to say girly men, to, <laughs> to make them um, more woman-like uh, than masculine because masculinity is, is what they say is toxic. Well, it causes a lot of guys to become insecure because we don't want to, as men, come off insensitively. We don't want to come off without tenderness and compassion and all of those wonderful traits that that make the human being what the human being is. And so we get a little confused. And I think that there is a whole generation being raised without fathers in the home, a uh, generation of, of boys who are having a, dis, a very tough time discovering what it means to be a man. And so when David was speaking to his son, as you just mentioned here in in First Kings chapter two, and he had said uh, the day it reads in First Kings chapter two one and two, the days of David drew near that he should die. He charged Solomon his son, saying, "I go the way of all the earth," and went on to say, "Be strong, therefore, prove yourself a man." Well, he also goes on to define what he's speaking about as he continues in the in the verses that follow. This is what it means to be a man. In verse 3, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way and walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And so we have... You hear even in its context what he's speaking about when he relates to saying to Solomon, be a man. But as a man, well, in this in this context, a man is one who keeps the charge of the Lord. 
He's one who walks in God's ways. He's one who has integrity, keeping his statutes and his commandments, his judgments. Uh, he's somebody who is walking before the Lord in truth. These, these are character traits. This isn't just that, uh, that he's a masculine man or a warrior man. This is a good man. So what, what I want to be is a good man, a man with integrity, a man who keeps God's commands. Well, you look at his commands, and there's so many commands that are related to us in Scripture, including to love our wives, mm-hmm. love our children, you know, to to follow the, his precepts, uh, to to be aware of the fact that there is but one God, therefore we worship him with all of our heart, even as Jesus would say, we worship him in spirit and in truth. Or we read his word and we act out the the role of a priest in the home so that our uh, children, should we have any, so that our wife should we be married, knows that there is a man of God in the house. There's a man who, uh, who has taken God's word seriously and who lives accordingly. So the attribute of a, of a man uh, is, is not simply the physicality, you know, that he may be larger, may be stronger, may be fiercer, but it's the quality of his, of his heart and his faith and his walk with God and his capacity to to have a, a good name, to have integrity. These are all aspects that make you a man of God. And I really think that um, rather than using these uh, images of manhood that uh, are really frail in the end and, and disappear over time, the things that really last are, are not the physicality, not the strength and all of that. It's it's the, the fact that though the outer man perishes, the inner man is renewed day by day. The longer you walk with the Lord, the stronger you become in the Lord, right? Uh, we were speaking earlier, John, let me remind you in this, in this conversation of how that at one time, there were many who said that Muhammad Ali mm-hmm. <laughs> was the greatest fighter. And um, I, I, I don't, I never was an admirer of, Muhammad Ali, you know, in his fighting capacity, but that may be heresy to some, <laughs> and that's okay. I, I think what turned me off about him uh, was his mouth and his attitude and the things that went along with that. And, you know, so I was not one of his admirers, though I did believe that he was quite capable in the ring. He most certainly was, and there's no denying that. But, you know, at, at the end of his life, he proved himself to be just a human being like everybody else. And maybe in his prime, he had a fierceness to him and a a quality of being a warrior that was unmatched in many ways. The end, he died like every other man dies. And um, so you can't put your your whole um, train of thought on, oh, a man is big, strong, and powerful because even the biggest and strongest and most powerful go the way of all the earth, they all die. So there's gotta be something stronger than my physicality, my capacity. You know, you don't stay 21, 22 forever. You may be fortunate in the Lord to grow to be 50, 60, Mm -hmm. 70 years old. And then you pretend as you remember your youth, you always seem somehow to have gotten, you were, you know, in other words, you were, yeah, when I was 20, I was faster, you know, and I was stronger. And, and we always are faster and stronger than we really were in our memory. You know, yeah, I could bench 500 pounds, you know, <laughs> things like that, you know. We exaggerate our own strengths and our own abilities because uh, we want to believe we were more than we actually really were. But you can't exaggerate integrity and you can't exaggerate character because that either it is or it isn't. Either you have it or you don't, right? So the strongest men I've ever known are not necessarily the most physically powerful men. They're the men of character. When you look at men like, uh, like Samson in Scripture, and nobody would, uh, would uh, debate, at least in the Bible, nobody would debate that he of all human beings outside of Jesus himself was the most powerful, mm-hmm. and he most certainly was. But he also had his tremendous weaknesses, and he wasn't sold out to God, and he ultimately ended up blind and a slave of the Philistines, and he ultimately ended up dying by his own hand 
even though he slew many of the of the Lord's enemies while doing so. So physicality, strength like that is is to be wondered at, but it certainly isn't what God has called each one of us has been to have. He's called us to have character, to be loving and gentle, to be caring and considerate, to be compassionate while yet remaining strong enough to handle the difficulties, to, to be the kind of man that, that a woman admires, to be the kind of man that other men can look up to and say, I want to I want to be like that. I, 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 I want what he has. That's how I felt about my own Pastor Chuck. That's how I felt about my own father. My dad was was my model. My dad got up in the morning and put his shoes on like every other man, but he did it every day regularly, Monday through Friday. He got into his little pickup truck and he went to work and he, he worked as a truck driver. He never became wealthy. My father um, didn't make that much. But my father was a man of integrity, a man of character. And my father told me as, as a boy, and very seldom did he ever lecture me. As a matter of fact, very, very few times did he ever really even talk much to me. He was very quiet. But I watched him. And my mom would tell me things about my dad. And they were true. And my mom would say things like, your dad will not eat if he has a bill to pay. Mm. And that was true. That, that's, that's absolutely true. We had what people today would throw out and call scraps. And those were our meals very often because my father wasn't making so much that he could throw away food. My dad was making enough to pay his bills, take care of my mom's medical bills, and to make sure his children had had some potatoes and some cheap cuts of meat and uh, on occasion even have some um, ice cream. That was my dad. But I learned from my father. I, I, I learned that. Working hard has, is, is a reward in and of itself. To be able to put food on a table, and take care of your children, to be respected by your wife, and to be respected by, by other people, other men, and even to be admired by, by, by my mom's friends who admired and loved my dad. That's what I wanted to be when I grew to be a man. I wanted to be like my father because he worked hard, provided, he had honesty, integrity. His, his name meant something. He told me that. He said, you know, son, he said, take care of your name. He said, take care of your reputation. Be a man of integrity. You know, be honest. My dad, my dad was that man. Now, that's not strength. You know, that's not picking up 400 pounds and that's not running through, uh, you know, with the ball through 11 powerful men and scoring a touchdown. As a guy who just put his shoes on and went to work, that was my dad. And so, you know, when David was speaking to Solomon, Solomon, you're the king. You, you know, I'm handing you what was given to me. You know, and uh, David was a warrior, but he didn't say to him, Solomon, pick up a sword and fight. He said, walk with God, keep his statutes, keep his commands, you know, do the, th do the things that God says to do and you'll be a man. Mm -hmm. And so that's a man. A man is somebody who's walking in faith, loving God with all of his heart and leading his family in the ways of the Lord, not relying on the wife to give the devotions to the children at night, not relying on the wife to say the prayers with the babies before they go to bed, but doing it himself, you know, um, opening up that book himself and living that book in front of those children. So they say that my father, my father was someone who not only told me what to do, but my father showed me what to do. Now, that's a man. Mm. And that's basically what uh, I would say that that Dave is commanding his boy. That's amazing. E even as as uh, you're, you're sharing that, I'm thinking, you know, we, we, we hear about David's mighty men. We read about it. We read about warriors. But what you're explaining, at least to me, that's what a warrior is. Fighting Absolutely. for your family, providing for your family, and uh, and as men, we can we can we can, our goal is to become that type of man by what David is saying here to Solomon. You know, Pastor, as as uh, you know, you're explaining the qualities and the characteristics of a man, and it's not based on appearance; it's based on what it's spelled out here in First Kings chapter two. You know, and and as men, we need to rally together. 
We need to lift each other up in prayer. We need to lift you up in prayer, uh, other men, and, and follow these instructions as David gave to Solomon. But you know, one of the questions I have for you is, is we see things like this, a crisis like we're going through right now in our in our nation, and 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 we see our nation rallying together. We see people coming together. Uh, we see churches are growing, whether online or in, you know in house, and and people's their their walk with the Lord seems to strengthen. But how do we prepare as men, men of God, when all this has settled and there's been a drop off? How would how do we stay? men of God in times where we can see that drop potential drop off. Well, you know, here's the thing, you know, there's uh, everybody becomes very faith filled in a, in a foxhole. It's, <laughs> it's been said that, and it's true. It's been said that, um, there are no atheists in foxholes. And, and, and I would say that, um, in my life experiences, I've seen that to be true. I had a friend of mine, his name was Danny. When I was in the military, I served as most of my boys, my men know, I served in the army. And, uh, you know, um, I, I was a paratrooper and, um, and I loved, I loved jumping. They, I was part of what was called a rigor, rigor unit, which means that we, the unit I was, uh, part of 82nd QM AES company, um, was, uh, they were the riggers. They would take the parachutes and pack them. That's what that my company did that. Now they wanted to send me to rigger school to learn to rig shoots, but I said, no, I'm not going to go. I don't want to. And they needed a truck driver in my, um, in my, um, where I was stationed, they needed me to drive a truck and that's what I did. So I never went to rigger school, but, um, I spent, uh, 18 months. I think it was 18 months, no, 20, 18 to 21 months. I forget now in the, in the 82nd. Well, I'm saying all of that to say this, that we didn't jump every week like some of the infantry did. We, we jumped every three months, you know. I jumped more than the average person did because I like to jump, but we didn't get that many jumps in. But whenever I had the opportunity, I jumped and I loved to jump. I loved, I loved jumping out of those helicopters and we jumped helicopters mostly. And I say that because I had a friend named Danny. Danny was afraid to jump. Danny, Danny, Danny went through jump school. He made his five jumps, you know, and uh, he qualified. But if he could get out of jumping, he would because he was afraid that he was going to end up dead. And one day he had to jump and I jumped with him. And we used to go up in uh, helicopters. And I forget now as I'm, it's been almost, you know, 48 years since I was in the military, maybe a little longer now as I think about it, but we were sitting on a, on a Huey in a helicopter, and I think we had what they called sticks, and we used, I think there were three or four of us that were seated next to the open door, and Danny, whom I also knew as Roland and Rocky, because he gave all these different names, he was the biggest liar I ever met, but he was seated next to me, and you had to, you know, sit cross-legged, and you had a strap in front of you and the helicopter would go up 1500 feet and then they would remove the strap and you're sitting right at the edge. And the helicopter pilots used to like to kind of tip the <laughs> helicopter over so that you were kind of leaning out. Now I was thrilled by that. I liked it because we had what was called a static line and it was on, on a line. So we had our deployment line on a line like this and, um, you know, so when you jumped, the static line would come to its conclusion, pull the D-bag, the deployment bag off of your chute, your chute would pop. And it was just, man, it was a blast. I loved it. I enjoyed it. So I still remember being on the, sitting there with my friend Danny. And I'm just, I'm just enjoying it because I, I loved it. And we're up there 1500 feet and, and we're, we're flying and we're about to jump. And I, Danny was somebody who didn't talk about the Lord, and he was a good, good friend of mine, so I talked to him quite often, though he claimed he was a Christian. He hadn't at that time really shown any fruit of it. But I remember this one time in particular, he was right on my right side, and I'm just looking outside, and it's just, John, it is just, a, it's so beautiful. I mean, you'd love it. You really would. 
it's just so beautiful. It's so quiet up there. And, and you're about to jump and it's just so much fun. So I turned to him and I said, Danny, man, this is so bad. This is, his eyes were shut as tight as anybody I've ever seen. I mean, you know, that real, real tight, closed eyes and his mouth was moving so fast. Oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. I'll never forget that. I started busting up at, because there are no atheists in foxholes, you know? And he became extremely religious at that time. So I, I, I think that with situations we're going through here in the United States and worldwide, but the thing that the church is going through right now, I've seen it through the years. I've been a Christian since 1970. I'm going on 50 years of walking with Christ. I have seen earthquakes hit where people suddenly flood into churches. I've, I've seen 9-11 and 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 when people, oh, Y2K, Y2K, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And all these churches are preparing their people for Y2K. Oh, the disaster is coming and the church is showing up and they're afraid and they're buying their guns and their generators and their grain. And they're going to be safe, you know, because my pastor said so. And then it comes and goes and nothing happens. And the church that had grown, sometimes it dwindles. And I think that'll happen again. That's my, my sorrowful prediction is through, through this time of virus and fear. Yeah, there are going to be people who suddenly give their gifts and there's suddenly is, they're going to show up in church. And, and when we're able to uh, once again assemble churches um, that, that, that had to close their doors for a while, when they open up, they'll be dancing up the aisle. They'll be excited. And then about a month later, They'll go back to the same garbage that they were doing prior to it because we forget just as fast as we remember sometimes, John. And so what do I think is going to happen? I think that when we get back to, to church, and, and I'm looking forward to that, that the church will be more full than normal. And then people are going to be settled again. And then they're going to go back to the routines. And then they're going to go back to just normal life. And then they're going to go back to just voluntarily showing up at church when they feel like it and not showing up at other times. And unless the men and women, unless the families, unless they get into the word, unless they start doing for their families what they should have been doing all along, having reading time with the kids, prayer time with one another, having their devotions and, and praying and turning on the online and learning from their home church, from the pastor. If, if they don't do that, you know, the, the church will be full again for a week or two or three. And um, they'll go back to watching their sports and they'll go back to mowing their lawns on Sunday and taking their kids to soccer or, or a little league or whatever it is that distracts them. And they'll go back to the way of life unless they really allow the lessons that we're going through right now, unless they really allow them to make a permanent impact on them, I would say that what I expect here at our church is the first time we get together again, and I'm looking forward to that. We're going to have a celebration. You know this. I know this. It'll be cheering. They'll be, oh, welcome back. I love you guys. I missed you. And people will be crying. There'll be tears three, three weeks later. Uh, they'll they'll do what they used to do every Easter. We have to bring out every ch extra chairs. We have to have extra parking because every Easter people decide they're Christian for a day. And my encouragement to the men who are listening to us right now, my encouragement is is change for good. Don't don't change for the time being. Change for good. Make this the opportunity for you to be the man of the house you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Get into the word, get into prayer, lead your family, monitor them. They're on the, they're, they're on their um, iPhones and the iPads and they're watching garbage. You're allowing it. Monitor them, restrict them, spend time with them, talk to them, take them outside. If you have to visit with them, be careful to, to, to capture these moments and use them for good and change the direction that your family's been going. Be the man of the house. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd encourage you to. Men, you heard this ex or ex exhortation by our pastor. And pastor, thank you again so much for your time. And uh, men, 
We'll be joining you next week, and we look forward to visiting with you again. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.